When you hear about things such as digital transformation, it essentially means many modern enterprises today are transacting their business through APIs. So all the core capabilities that have been locked in some systems of record, such as ERP systems, some of the systems which are homegrown, are now unlocked as APIs in this modern world, which means you can take those APIs and not only create some excellent productivity applications internally, you can take them out to your partners and build this whole ecosystem. APIs are becoming more and more central to every organization that is trying to participate in the digital world. We take a slightly opinionated view about APIs, and we start with what we call as the digital value chain. It's actually a very simple concept if you think about it. At the end of the day, all what matters is the entity to your left or my right, which is the customer or the end user. It's all about delivering delightful and connected experiences to those end users through an app. An app can be of any kind. It could be a mobile app, could be an app which is built in the web, or even a set-top box. Well, they are developers who build those apps, right? And they build those apps using well-curated APIs, which are managed by an API team. And this API team comprises of API developers who will use a platform such as Apigee Edge to manage, secure, publish those APIs. And essentially, the API layer really sits on top of any backend system that you may have. Between the application and the API itself, we have a set of runtime services. And that's where we can insert policies. And Frith Paul's going to show you how we create those policies and what they can do. And those policies can do all sorts of things. Like I said, security, rate limiting, you know, you'll get the whole story there. And then on top, there are a bunch of services that enable that. So for instance, there's a management component that is responsible and supplies both a user interface and an API for manipulating all of these components, programming the proxies, com configuring the developers and the applications. And everything that Prithpal is going to do in the UI has an associated API as well. There are also a set of developer services. Those are the, the, the developer portals and the tools that we can use in order to construct a web presence for our API so a developer can really you know, connect and, and learn how to use the API. And there are a set of analytic services that are gathering metadata about all of the API traffic and presenting it in different ways so that you can report on it, create custom reports, and see all sorts of information about how the API is being used. Now, Apigee Edge is a product for all this. We think really that all APIs go through a very similar life cycle like this. Um, we're going to start at the top with API design, but we're going to move on to how you actually design your API and how you share that API design with others, how you actually turn that API into something that's on the internet, how you add layers of security to your API using industry standards, how you publish your API to create a developer portal and a web presence developers can use to sign up for your API, what to do if your API gets a lot of traffic? How is it going to scale? How are we going to monitor what's going on and get analytics so we can understand how the API is going to be used? And there are lots and lots of ways to monetize APIs. And one of the ways is, of course, to charge for API calls. And if that's an option that works for your business, that's something we're going to talk about as well. Let's start with design. And Prithpal is going to be sort of the, the, the person who does this, and I'm going to ask him some questions. But you know, I'm, I'm an API developer. I've heard of Swagger. Mm -hmm. hear a lot of, and, and I hear about something called Open API, which sounds like a less exciting way to say swagger. Um, but I, as I understand it, I can design and I can describe my API in Open API. And if I do that, there's all kinds of neat things I can do to generate cool documentation and to share my API documentation with other people. Can you show us a little bit Absolutely. how I can do that? Absolutely. So you're right. Open API is a, a great way to be able to share what an API does. It's an excellent contract which can be used to not only create API, but also share that across different developers so they have a common sense of what an API looks like. Can we, OK, we are on the demo screen out here. So what you see out here is I'm logged into Apigee Edge. This is the Apigee Edge cloud version. Looks exactly the same like when you would deploy it on premises. I'm actually <laughs> leveraging me, a brand new uh, Apigee Edge experience. This is a user interface we actually released just about a few months back. 
and it is centered around the API lifecycle. So in this case, I'll do a little bit of level setting here. I'm connected to the Demofy org. Think about org as a short for an organization. And it's the container where I, as a business unit or a team or a company, if it is small enough, will build all my APIs and add some policies. Okay? So the very first thing we're going to do is start off with taking a spec. In this case, I'm going to take the liberty of leveraging a spec that is called Open API uh, for hotels. It's a very simple spec, which is uh, sitting somewhere in the, uh, in the internet. In this case, it happens to be just a simple gist on a GitHub account. So let's go to the APG Edge screen. So that spec, that YAML, was the design of my API. So as a developer, I might, I might use a tool to generate it, or I might just typey type type, right? Exactly. OK. So it all starts from the spec editor. So I'm in the tool. I click on the spec icon, and let's go import the spec. So I'm just going to paste the URL that I just picked up from there and say import. And assuming the demo gods are with us today, it should, in a few seconds, actually show you how the hotel's open API spec looks like. So Greg, as you can see out here, uh, it, it spits out some very important information out there, such yep. as on the left-hand side, talks about what the host name is, the base path is. But more importantly, this is information that gets synchronized left to right. So everything you want to know Right, so on the right, I have a nicely formatted set of docs for my API. Exactly. And then more importantly, if we now start examining this, this simple API doc, it very clearly describes what this API should be doing. In okay. this case, we have certain resources which have been declared out here, such as how do I query a specific hotel, right? So you have different kinds of options provided to you out there options to kind of update hotels in this case. So we're going to use the backdrop of a hotel as an example. And then you also have the ability for you to actually get a list of all hotels. So Greg, as, you, as we just kind of were discussing, the open API spec gives you the ability to communicate your intent. And in this case, the open API editor, or open API, which used to be earlier known as Swagger, is integrated right into the product. Once you have imported the spec, you can actually collaborate with other API developers in the team. So they can edit, make some mods, perhaps add some changes. And then you can take it to the next step of that publishing or uh, to actually creating an API. So once I have a spec, you know, now what do I do? How do I actually turn this? Now clearly, you know, I'm a developer. I probably wrote some node code or something to implement my API. Maybe I wrote some node code that uses Postgres, and I deployed it to Google Cloud or wherever. It doesn't really matter where I deploy mm -hmm. it. But I now want to have all the API management goodness and all the serviceability of Apigee around my API. So, so how do I do that? Yeah, so that, that's a great point. So now we're going to focus on, great, I have some design using an open API spec. How do I take it to the next level of actually building an API proxy? OK, so let's switch over to the demo, please. All right, so I have an API. Using actually, using a simple click, I can click on the generate API proxy button. I can give it the base path. Let's call it v1 slash reservations. And again, all I'm doing out here is it has picked up all that information from the open API spec. In this wizard, I'm just making a few changes because I would like for the API proxy to be deployed in a very specific way. You can see there's a backend endpoint. This actually happens to be an existing API endpoint. So if I was to go out here and query this, this is exactly the backend API that Greg was just talking about. This is running somewhere in the cloud. Could be the Google Cloud. Could be any other data center. Doesn't really matter. This is the endpoint that we're going to create a proxy in front of. And then we'll use the API magic to add a bunch of different things. So I go back out here, click the Next button. And fair enough, the API proxy wizard has actually picked up all the different resources which was specified in the open API doc. And I have the option to say, great, I'm only going to do just retrieving all the hotels for right now. So we're just going to do the most basic API, which is get slash hotels. Exactly. Something very, very start. simple. 
And in this case, I'm going to add some security a little bit later on in the phase. But for right now, I just want to keep it as a simple pass-through proxy. Okay. And oh, by the way, by even making a simple pass-through proxy, you can get a lot of visibility and analytics on API usage. That's so let's go ahead and click Next here. It gives me the ability to decide where I would like to deploy the API. So let's just go with all the default settings and hit Build and Deploy. So at this point in time, it has built a very simple API. And I have a brand new endpoint, which is going to be now used to start sharing with your outside world. So, so in now instead case, of sending my API calls directly to my backend, I send them to Apigee. Exactly. Okay. So here's the Apigee endpoint. And I'm just using a simple REST client. In this case, it happens to be Postman. And when I call this, fair enough, it gives me the exact same result back from the backend API. And what's to stop someone from just you know, watching this demo on YouTube? Um, mm -hmm. and it's going to be on YouTube, right? And just you know, trying to hit that thing 1,000 times a second and trying to screw up our demo. Yeah, so that's a great point. How do you ensure you can keep things in checks and balances, right? So there are a variety of different ways. So in this case, what I would like to show you is, great, I have an API. And this is where the API proxy magic starts. So in this case, I've opened up an API proxy editor. This is where I, as the API developer or the API team, has the ability to put in a lot of different controls. And you put in those controls using what we call as API policies. So I click on this plus step icon, and it brings up the 30 different out-of-the-box policies that we have to do a variety of different things. So we have some traffic management policies, security. Some of this we're going to be taking a look at later on. Mediation. And then more importantly, you can extend the platform by using some of the extension policies. So you could literally use things like Java, JavaScript, or Python to pretty much author your own policy and share it with the uh, rest of the team. In this case, I will use something as simple as a spike arrest policy. The spike arrest policy, think of this as a system-wide policy, which can make sure that only a specific amount of transactions per second or transactions per minute, whatever that rate happens to be, it can control that so that none of your backend systems crash and burn. Right? As we know, that backend API is running somewhere. It's either in the cloud or it's running on-premises, and it has some finite capacity. Right? So in this case, I can make those quick changes using some configuration options. In this case, for the purposes of the demo, I'm just changing it to three per minute. What this means is do not allow any number of API calls or only allow three calls per minute. But of course, one of the things I would think is, you know, gee, you know, great, you got a spike arrest. Now the people watching on YouTube can't really mess things up. But my API still has no security. And you know, that's no good. I mean, I, I've read about OAuth. I understand that, uh, that OAuth is one of the, the de facto standards for API authentication. How can I start to add some of those things to my API without having to learn all the complexities of the spec and program it all myself? No, that, that's a great point, Greg. Uh, in fact, many customers that we talk to, OAuth 2.0 is, is a very popular uh, API security standard. right? So in this segment, we're going to take a look at how exactly we now take this API and actually protect it using an OAuth policy. OK? Let's switch to the demo, please. So let's carry this thing a little bit forward. I'm going to create and add a very simple OAuth 2.0 policy. When I add this, you can see that I'm trying to use the verify access token method. OK? And the verify access token method within this OAuth policy is actually going to ensure that this API, whenever invoked, is presented with a valid OAuth token. Okay? So just for kicks, I'll go back to my Postman client and hit a send request. And right away, you can see that it points out I need a valid token. So how do we go about getting this token? One of the key parts of the platform is the notion of an OAuth server. So Apigee Edge actually has a built-in OAuth server which can mint tokens, and we support a variety of different kinds of OAuth flows. Right? We have the standard two-legged and three-legged OAuth flows out of the box, 
And because the platform is customizable, you can actually support some other flows as well. Whether Apigee is the uh, platform that does the OAuth dance itself, or it integrates, which we have in the past with many different identity and access management systems, it can control that, mint tokens, take some else one, uh, other systems tokens, and enforce that and all that stuff. So in this case, in order to actually show you how this would work, I'm going to introduce a new concept, and that's of an API product. So what's an API product? An API product is actually the way you would want to expose your capabilities, which are nothing but APIs, in different shapes and sizes to consumers. So you could think about a strategy where I could take three APIs and only give read-only access through what we call as an API product. So an API product, and I'll build something out here called Hotels Gold. And you can assign some quotas out here. In this case, let's say 100 per minute. And I'm going to pick the API proxy that we just built, which is hotels. In this API product definition, I can add a bunch of different API proxies. And I can also limit them by perhaps all of these APIs only have get access. So you I can limit what I can do with the API, mm -hmm. as, as well as which parts of the API I can call, but also what I can do with it. OK? Exactly. Okay, cool. One of the other things I could do is the exact same API combination or perhaps a separate one, I could perhaps make a hotel's platinum product. Yep. In or which free. case, yes. Right. In which case, give them access to more APIs and perhaps let you do more with those APIs mm -hmm. itself and perhaps up your bandwidth to a thousand times a minute. Okay? So let's go ahead and save this API product. Great. So this is where, when we talk about the API team, you also have collaboration with not only the API developer, but the API product manager. If you think about digital business and API as products, that's exactly what we mean. Now you can bundle these APIs and then offer them to the outside world. So great, I have a product, but I need to be able to showcase some level of security access. So in this case, I'm going to introduce a concept of an app. Think about an app as the ability to actually generate some API keys. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to very quickly call this the Hotels Gold app. Pick a developer here. And in this case, I'm going to pick the Hotels Gold product and hit Save. So all what I've done so far is saying, great, I have an API product called Hotels. Now let me generate an app called Hotels app. This is the app which has an identifier, a key ID, and a secret, which you would share with the app developer who's going to consume the API. Okay? This is where the consumption angle comes in. So you can pretend you have 10 partners. Each one of them may have a separate app. Why would you do that? You would do that so you can track them separately. You can report usage. And as Greg mentioned, you can do some pretty exotic things. You could have some partners who are subscribed to the gold product and have access to lesser parts of the APIs or at a lower quota. Or you can create apps that give access to, let's say, the hotel's platinum product, which give you more access to the same APIs and additional stuff for some of the other APIs. Once I have the app, let's click on this. I have what we call as a key and secret. So what I'm going to do at this point is, as I mentioned, Apigee Edge also has a full-blown OAuth provider in the platform. I'm actually going to use a pre-configured token endpoint, which is enabled by default in any org that you provision. And I'm going to specify the client ID and the client secret. So what I'm really doing out here is I'm mimicking that I am an external client, which you have configured using an app. And someone has shared the app key and secret with me. Traditionally, the sharing of the app key and secret essentially happens through a developer portal. Okay, that's on the consumption side. So I call this, and I'm using the client credentials grant type, which may be very familiar to some of the folks who are perhaps API developers already. When I make a request out here, it gives me an access token. So I now have an access token, which can be used securely to access the API. This access token could be timed. It can also be scoped 
wherein it can give access to different parts of the API within the product. At the product level, level you can actually configure what kind of scopes it allows access to. So let's go remove the authorization header from here. So again, using simple policies, we can plug this thing in. And now, hopefully, this thing will let me through. So I really want my developers to have self-service. I don't want them to have to call you up and have you log into that thing and push a button to create an API key. I want to push a button, and I want to, as a developer, you know, have this thing work just as well as the Google Cloud APIs do. So can you show us a little bit how we might do that? Absolutely. Can we switch to the demo, please? So you're right. You need to be able to advertise to the world with an awesome API. And the way to do that is through a developer portal. In this new Apigee Edge experience, we've actually enabled that capability in the hands of developers. So I'm going to click on this icon here. And we're actually going to build a live portal as we go along uh, in this demo. So let's click on the plus portal icon. And let's call it the brand new Hotels API portal. And you can see this is a live URL which is being generated as we speak. Let's go ahead and create it. OK, so once I do that, it gives me something very basic and simple. And when I click on this, it gives you a street cards page, not something which I expected. I'm trying to build a hotels API, right? So let's see how we go about changing and customizing and show you the power of how you can do that all from within the tool. So in this section, I can go to the pages. So think about my role changing slightly where now I become part of the content team who is responsible for doing that. And you can do that from within the same tool. Apigee Edge has RBAC built into it, which means you could essentially have a role of that of a content developer who has access to only building out this portal and not mess with the API proxies and vice versa. Okay? So in this case, we go to the home page, and we can start making some changes here. We can call it hotels. and just change it in a couple places. And I hit Publish. Okay, So in this case, if I was to refresh this, great. I see that change. But I don't really like the picture here. It seems yeah. a little bit odd. It doesn't look like we, a hotel. We don't have any hotels in Chicago anyway. Yeah, we're, exactly. We're starting in San Francisco and New York only. So let, let's go change that. Well, how can I really do that? I can go back to the the hotel's main page out here, the portal page. And I will upload some handy files in here. So first, go and delete the, the default logo, which has been here. So right from here, I'm going to actually add a couple of files. In this case, the logo file. OK. I'm not a UX developer, <laughs> so just for the record. You spent a lot of time on that, I see. That's awesome. And a background, which I think is really neat. OK. So now let's go back and go to the, the theme setting out here. In this, you actually have the ability to change a few things. right? You can change. Again, this is a very simple markdown kind of uh, format. I can go change the footer, the background, everything. Oh, boy, it, CSS, it, OK. It's simple, easy. <laughs> it's just built on CSS. I know. Some, uh, some folks don't like it. But again, this hey, is it, very it simple. It runs the world. OK. I think I got it right. Let's go ahead and publish this portal. Hey, look at that. And just like that, I have a branded developer portal within a few clicks and minutes. The portal is its just a web app that calls the management uh -huh. APIs in Edge. Everything we've done in the UI has an associated API. We have a portal here, which is um, you know, kind of built into the product and very easy for customers to deploy. But we've also had customers build their own portal in their own way, completely custom with heavy input from their branding teams on top of our management API and really everything in between. So you can get going very quickly, as Prithpal is showing. And for many APIs, that's all you need.
but you also have the ability to do extensive customization. Now, once I've done this, I probably want it to scale. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, I got to assume that the Apigee Edge product running as a service can auto scale. It runs on top of Google Cloud. It even runs on top of Amazon Cloud. All those capabilities allow us to take advantage of auto scaling. And some of the interesting things you can do with Edge as a service, we've done a lot of work to make sure that it's not only scales, but it's very reliable. So, for instance, everything in the product is, is replicated across data centers. We use technologies like Cassandra. Remember, we run in a lot of different places, not mm -hmm. just the Google Cloud, uh, which allows us to have things like OAuth tokens and quotas and things like that work even in the failure of an entire geographical region. And our customers who run on-premises, they almost always run in their own data centers and they almost always have more than one data center. And none of them has asked us, actually one person asked us, for the old traditional, you know, failover, disaster recovery drill on the weekend thing. What they want is everything to be active, active across their data centers at all time. Now, this, this chart here shows the common case of auto-scaling, which is, you know, most APIs, just like most web apps, have a chart that looks kind of like this. You have big traffic peaks Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and whatever geography you're in, you have smaller traffic peaks on weekends, and it's pretty predictable, and auto-scaling systems like the ones built into the cloud can easily keep up, because every 10 or 15 minutes, they kind of average what's happening, and they, they add servers and take them away. So I talked about the scaling, I talked about all those kinds of things, but obviously within our global support centers, we're monitoring what's happening not only with the cloud, we run on great cloud platforms, but with our own application. You know, our certain, our certain API is using an excessive amount of traffic, and we've gotten to the point now where we have great people working behind the scenes, as well as a lot of automated monitoring, where we often detect problems with a customer's back-end API before they do. And sometimes we call them and say, hey, we're noticing a lot of errors from your API. We're noticing that the API traffic is coming to Apigee, but it's not necessarily getting to you. And they say, oh, you know, look at that. We're having a problem. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting world that we live in where we're kind of sitting in the middle of a lot of API traffic. But since we're sitting in the middle of this API traffic, there's some interesting stuff we can do about analyzing it. All the API calls p passing through Apigee, we can gather metadata. Because we do things like OAuth and API key validation, mm -hmm. we can record for you which developers, which applications, which geographical locations are accessing the API the most and allow you to do some interesting things in order to run your API program. Remember, in a lot of cases, you may have an API product management team that is actually trying to turn this API into a product. And even if it's not, even if it's just for, for, for customers or, or partners, it's very important that you understand what are the most popular APIs, what kind of SLA am I achieving, are my APIs very slow, do they have a high error rate, um, are, are certain applications more popular than others, are there giant changes, has an application suddenly gotten wildly popular, which might mean either you have a hit on your hands or someone has compromised some application credentials, and they're trying to use the API in a way that's not supposed to be used. So for all these reasons, there are a lot of analytical capabilities in the product. And let's see if we could take a look at how those work and what kind of information you can get. Sure. Let's switch to the demo, please. So back to the Apigee Edge UI, you can click on the Analyze uh, tab. And this gives you options around many out-of-the-box reports that are generated by default by the platform. So I was talking about. You know, you have an API proxy that's built. As API traffic is piping through the, through the gateway, we collect a lot of different kinds of metrics. Many of them we kind of publish out of the box in terms of these reports. So the very first one out here is the API proxy performance report. Now, this gives you a very broad idea of how the API proxies are doing, and which means the general, general amount of API traffic piping through the system. In this case, I have a few different API proxies which are deployed in this org. And you can see the total traffic coming out through here. And in a very quick snapshot, the kind of number of errors, the percentage of errors, so on and so forth. You can also see the amount of time which is being spent in the API proxy versus the average target response time. So the amount of time that Apigee might be taking to execute those policies I put in. Exactly. Keeping in mind, policies are sometimes simple things like spike arrest, or sometimes they're my own JavaScript code or my own Java code, and that can be any number of, of milliseconds, right? Exactly. So. so this starts to give you a good idea of the kind of things you should be doing within the API platform. Certainly, we run into situations where customers are doing some heavyweight transformation. There are some other tools which are really good for that. Your API platform is a tier of agility. 
This is your face to the outside world. You want to keep it as quickly as possible, process as many transactions as possible. There are a bunch of different reports which you're not going to go through today, but again, you can check them out. Uh, you know, we have a free trial account which anyone out here can sign up for today. But what I am going to touch on very briefly is the notion of custom reports. So although a lot of these out-of-the-box reports are great, but many times you have the requirement, if think about APIs become your channel, uh, your digital channel, business wants to know what kind of orders are, am I processing, right? What kind of hotel reservations have gone through this? So you need the ability to be able to create custom which can be presented to a business user. In this case, I'll just give a very simple example of a custom report. In this case, it just shows you the amount of uh, traffic coming in from different APIs. Now, these APIs could represent different business segments, such as orders, such as payments, so on and so forth. And using some simple heuristics, we aggregate the data, and then you have the ability to kind of dissect through this and figure out what's really going on with the APIs. You can delve deeper. We have a bunch of different kinds of metrics out here. If you were to click in the Edit tab here, you can just add different out-of-the-box metrics which are available at a high level, right? All the traditional stuff that you can expect to be. You can also see some custom dimensions out here. These are the ones which you as an API developer can have the ability to create some custom dimensions. So imagine we capture usually any information that can be gleaned on from the header information or any kind of uh, commonly available user agent stuff that's available. But as an API developer, within the API proxy, you can actually add policies such as a statistics collector policy, and that will start scraping out all the useful analytics that you need. In this case, the order amount and the order discount, right? Once you do that, you can add various kinds of dimensions, and you can see the amount of stuff that's available to you, some common dimensions which you can slice and dice using the geographic region, uh, region that you're coming from, any specific developer app, perhaps, who's calling it. You can use some custom dimensions out here. And many of the advanced dimensions are available for you to use by default. Once you do this, you actually have a very simple report, which can then be shared in a secure way by different kinds of users. And of course, the reports have APIs. And the last thing is, let's talk a little bit about money. I want to make some money on my API. Now, it turns out there are a lot of ways to make money on your API. Back in our hotels API, I might make money by having people stay in my hotels. Or sometimes I make money because my API drives other product sales. But you know, I might be doing something really interesting. I might be in finance, and I'm trying to do a market data API. Mm -hmm. Those folks are actually next door. Or I might be in the news, and I might charge a lot of money for extremely, extremely timely news, or who knows what. Um, I might want to actually charge per API call and have different tiers and different kinds of prices for different API calls. Is there a way that I could do that? And Absolutely. Okay. Let's uh, switch to the demo again, please. This is actually by design, going from slides to demo, just to make sure you guys are up. Yeah. The attention. person no, taking the screen apart is not by design, but that's OK. <laughs> um. <laughs> OK, so let's use a live example in this case. right? I'm going to very quickly talk about Pitney Bowes, which was also mentioned in the keynote. And this happens through a developer portal. So I gave you a very broad and very high-level example of how we could take and build a developer portal. This is another example of how they've taken the developer portal and customized it. And they also happen to leverage some of the monetization capabilities of the APGH platform. If you think about monetization, once you hit a level of maturity in your APIs and you want to make money off your APIs, which would seem natural at some point, you can use some of the monetization capabilities provided by APGH. We are going to review the consumer side of it, but from the producer side or the provider side of APIs, you can create different rate plans, right? Because you may want to offer APIs so that people can consume based on different kinds of dimensions. Perhaps you want to sell APIs using volume-based pricing, right? Maybe these many number of API calls per month. Or you may want to charge separately for each transaction. Or you might want to do revenue sharing, where you give developers money for building apps that use your API. Exactly. So Walgreens is another example of how they use revenue share when they have their partners who are sending business to them. So the developers get a cut of that transaction amount. OK. So in this Pitney Bowes developer portal, you can see they have different kinds of APIs. I'm going to click on the GeoSearch API and click on Pricing Plans. This gives you the consumer side of it. So if you are an app developer trying to use some of the Pitney Bowes APIs, in this case, GeoSearch, 
you can sign up for different kinds of plans. In this case, they are doing volume-based pricing, where you can get 5K, 10K, et cetera, and different credits. And in this case, you can build custom plans. So this gives you one glimpse of how you can use monetization, both from the provider side, and in this case, from the consumer side, to now monetize your APIs. So what's a credit? Is that like, like a different points for different API calls? Exactly. So okay. in this case, they, they have this notion of some kind of a freemium uh, tier where when you're using a higher tier, they give you more and more credit. So the upside for the developers oh, I to, see. That's to use more and more APIs, exactly. And different API calls could have different weights, essentially, right? Exactly. OK. Awesome. Cool. So back to you. OK. So back to the slides one last time. So what we've done, really, is we've gone through the whole life cycle of APIs. We've talked about everything from designing a spec and publishing the spec as documentation to creating an API proxy and adding policies so I can have some of the different levels of service around my API without changing what's on my back end. We talked about how to create a developer portal and actually publish that API for use by developers, how I can use analytics to find out how my API is being used, and if I want to charge for my API, like Pitney Bose is doing using the Apigee Edge product, mm -hmm how we can do that as well. So you know, basically, that's what we do with Apogee Edge. We provide a product that allows people to configure all of that stuff to work the way they need it.